David Savitz. I'll be uh, presenting the, uh, summarizing, I should say, the probable link evaluations. And of course, you have in your folders the uh, more detailed reports for the series of, of reproductive health outcomes we looked at. Uh, next slide. The, just to, to review uh, the uh, uh, bases for this and the, the background a little bit, uh, as you're all aware, I'm sure the settlement agreement uh, uh, pointed us specifically to make these sorts of assessments. Um, and it asks a very specific question, as phrased there in the second bullet point, given the available evidence, is it more probable than not that a connection is present between C8 or PFOA and human disease? And so we relied both on available data, but as you'll see here, uh, we needed to collect a, a substantial amount of data uh, on our own simply because the previous research was, was really very uh, limited, in some cases absent, uh, for addressing this. Um, we considered all scientifically relevant data that we were able to locate in, which we were able to generate. And we, as, as I indicated when we were here last time talking about the process, this is a, a judgment that we made, obviously. It's a, uh, a judgment that the three of us made collectively considering a number of factors, looking at the strength of associations, whether there's a graded dose response, do people have more exposure across the spectrum, have more uh, risk of disease, uh, uh, whether the uh, role of random error, there's a certain amount of statistical noise that's inherent in these kinds of studies, and other sorts of methodologic issues, controlling and considering other causes of the disease, uh, acknowledging the limitations in study methods, and considering whether it makes biologic sense to think that C8 might be related to these diseases. When we observe in associations, or the way we, we operationalize this, is, you know, assuming there, you know, a statistical association is found, we have to make a judgment. And it's simply whether that association is either more likely to be due to the C8, or it's more likely to be due to other factors. And with the way the, uh, the assessment is set up, it, the balance is tipped if it's more than 50%. It's, it's a, a different way than we might do it you know, in other settings, but in this particular uh, framework of the settlement, that is our charge, and that's what we have tried to do, is make a judgment. It's either one or the other. If you see an association, it's either due to uh, the, the C8, or it's due to other factors, and we have to decide, uh, you know, the, the judgment there, okay? So, uh, obviously, we're here presenting on the reproductive outcomes now, but just to give you a, a preview of what's coming next in the, uh, uh, probably, you know, sometime in the spring of 2012, we expect to have another uh, series of probable link assessments that we're able to uh, uh, provide, and then we've uh, committed to and plan on adhering to the plan by which, uh, in July of 2012, we will complete the, uh, the remainder of the health outcome. So the ones we're reporting on now, I'll just go through the different categories of, of uh, reproductive health, and I recognize I've, I've tried to keep it as non-technical as possible, but there's a uh, certain need to, to try to be clear on, on the definitions here. Uh, first, I'll talk about is pregnancy loss, which refers to miscarriage uh, when it occurs earlier in pregnancy or stillbirth when the, uh, the baby is lost later in pregnancy. Uh, Pregnancy-induced hypertension, which is when someone who was not hypertensive before the pregnancy develops elevated blood pressure in the course of the pregnancy as a result of the pregnancy. And there's a particular type uh, when uh, there's protein in the urine, when there's leakage of protein into the urine, combined with the hypertension, we call it preeclampsia. Uh, but then there's also, of course, it may be absent and it's, the, the protein in the urine may not be present, but it's still pregnancy-induced hypertension regardless. And as we'll describe it, we've considered pregnancy-induced hypertension in the aggregate, both the subset with preeclampsia and the others. Preterm birth and low birth weight are different ways we measure prematurity, babies that are either born too early or too small. And there's a variety of indices for this, but we've discussed those uh, in the same uh, grouping. And then finally, birth defects, which are uh, congenital malformations, which uh, I think people are you know, familiar with a wide variety of, uh, uh, of those that, that can occur. So first talking about pregnancy loss, there, um, uh, the, the key evidence for this were the four studies that were conducted in the Mid-Ohio Valley. And I won't walk you through all the technical details, but there are a number of 
different ways that exposure was measured. As Dr. Seenland explained, it can be estimated based on these historical estimates. We can use the serum measures, and it depends on the timing. I won't, again, I think it would be tedious to go through each of these, but we've enumerated them and say more about them in the reports. But we basically used data from the CA Health Project participants. We considered both the serum measurements and the environmental modeling to estimate exposure. We were able to get birth records on stillbirth from West Virginia. Ohio was not able to provide those, but we considered those as well. And we also considered new data that has recently become available from the cohort follow-up of the CA Health Project participants, again, that Dr. Seenland referred to, and that there's also a status report in the folder. We haven't talked about it separately because that's now part of the constellation of information we had to use for the probable links. So in looking at the overall array of evidence, we found there was an absence of evidence indicating increasing risk with increasing exposure with respect to pregnancy loss. We looked to see whether the more refined or accurate measures of exposure tended to show an increased risk, which it did not. The toxicology provided little indication directly about these outcomes, not suggesting an issue of pregnancy loss. And so in balance, we concluded that the evidence does not support a probable link between PFOA and pregnancy loss. For pregnancy-induced hypertension, there were a number of studies that were assembled. Again, the key evidence actually did come from studies that we were involved with developing. We had four studies which used birth records. On the birth certificate, there's an indication of pregnancy-induced hypertension. And we considered those both as independent source of information, looking at the residents of the Mid-Ohio Valley through birth records alone, but also then linking that to the CA Health Project participants. And again, in the similar to what I described before, of using it in this new population of births which was assembled that occurred after the CA Health Project began through the cohort follow-up. Next slide. And we also were able to look, in this case, they used the terminology of self-reported preeclampsia from the CA Health Project, both in relation to serum measures and historical values. Next. Here, we basically combined the evidence from all six of those reports in our consideration and our deliberation. What we saw across the studies were a number of positive associations noted in some but not all analyses in all five of the projects. But I don't want to overstate the consistency or the persuasiveness. This was, in a number of cases, fairly small increases in risk. Many of them did not follow dose-response gradients. But there was a consistency there that we found to be notable. Continuing with sort of the deliberation of the background, we did see in some cases that the measurements that may well be more accurate showed stronger evidence of an association, which is important for ones closer in time to the pregnancy. And in looking at them in the aggregate, while each of the individual associations across these studies might well be a result of chance or some other methodologic problem, when we looked at them in the aggregate, it seemed somewhat less likely than 50 percent that these were all attributable to methodologic problems. That's a judgment, and it was something that we inferred that based on the degree of corroboration across a series of studies, even though the risks were small and not by any means consistent, but that the evidence was sufficient to conclude that there is a probable link between PFOA, C8, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. Next slide. For preterm birth, again, I won't go over these. These are the same studies we used for these various outcomes, but again, a series of studies from the Mid-Ohio Valley, both using birth certificate data and C8 Health Project participants. Next slide. Looking at the evidence for preterm birth, we saw no associations across all studies for preterm birth as a group, the total set of preterm births. There was 
one exception from the birth certificate data where we saw an association for very early preterm birth, but this was not supported in any of the other studies, and we made the judgment that this was more likely to be a result of random error than something that's linked to uh, C8. And so in the aggregate, we, uh, in balance, we, we uh, inferred that the evidence does not support a probable link between uh, PFOA and preterm birth. Yes. Low birth weight, again, the same series of studies. Uh, I just want to think for the next slide. And now there was some evidence here across studies suggesting there might be a small decrease in average birth weight with elevated PFOA, but it's unclear whether that really is a result of the PFOA. And furthermore, these very small shifts in birth weight are really not of medical or clinical significance. We're talking about when you're talking about differences in the order of 10 or 20 grams, it really does not matter much with respect to the baby's health. The studies that looked at low birth weight, the more severe end of the spectrum that does matter, tended not to find any associations with, uh, with C8. And so in the aggregate, we said that the evidence does not support the conclusion of a probable link between PFOA and low birth weight. Next. For birth defects, there were uh, fewer studies available that, that provided uh, uh, information here. Mainly the result, there was one study that was done uh, by another group uh, in, in the area uh, that found very, very few cases and was not very informative, but otherwise it was based on the uh, self-reported data from the C8 Health Project participants. Okay. So overall, little indication of an association. There was some suggestion of an association specifically for congenital heart defects, but based on rather limited data. And so in the uh, imbalance, we in, uh, uh, concluded that the evidence does not support a probable link between PFOA and birth defects. Next slide. So for the last one, in, in our overall assessment of this array of outcomes, we uh, did make the judgment that there's evidence supporting a probable link for pregnancy-induced hypertension, which includes preeclampsia, and that there's insufficient evidence to uh, conclude that there's a probable link for these other health outcomes of pregnancy loss, that is miscarriage and stillbirth, preterm birth, low birth weight, or uh, birth defects. So you can shut that off now. And um, that uh, concludes my, my comments. We intended this now to be open, of course, to uh, questions.